look around, most of us are not spring chickens, and some of us are probably used to taking a fire nap. So I purposely made that our list a little bit shorter, and Lord willing, uh, we won't uh, go a normal 45 minutes, maybe. It's kind of like this kid brought his, his uh, unsafe partner to the church with him one time. The kid never been to church. And uh, they got up. And he uh, asked her buddy, he said, why is, why is everybody singing? And he explained to him, you know, that's the way we worship God, by singing. And then I said a prayer. He said, why is everybody praying? He said, well, that's part of the worship. And then they took a little horse step with him. And I said, why are they doing that? He said, well, we do this so we remember what Jesus did for us. And then the preacher got up and the preacher took his watch. But he was a parallel cat. And the kid said, what is he doing that for? What does that mean? And the kid looked at him and shook him. Should have said, said, don't mean nothing. <laughs> so, I'll try not to do that, okay? <laughs> don't mean anything. You know, our lesson, if you noticed, you might have thought that was kind of a, a strange title for a lesson. Huh? Lesson from geese. And you said, oh, you know, I come here to study God's word, so what, what's, what's this guy going to do? You know, the scriptures often point to nature for illustration and wisdom. Look at Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 11, where the psalmist, uh, rather Solomon wrote, Go to the ant, you sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise. In other words, he said, you can learn something from, from an ant, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer, and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you slumber, O slugger? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall your poverty come on you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. Now, of course, the lesson ends there. You know, uh, if you don't work, <laughs> you know, you, you're going you're gonna to be poor. You're going to be poor. So there's a lesson there from that. Well, and if that wasn't enough, Jesus himself said to look at the birds, consider the lilies. Look at Mark 6. Mark 6. Whoops, I'm losing all my stuff here. Mark 6, verses 26 through 28. Look, look what the Lord said. Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit <coughs> to his stature? So what do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his wisdom was not arrayed like one of these. <coughs> Excuse me. So, found on the internet are some facts and lessons we can learn from geese. Dr. Robert McNash, former assistant superintendent of Baltimore Public Schools, wrote a little article entitled Lessons from Geese in 1972 that could be applied to our relationships with one another in the church. And that's what I'd like to talk about a little bit about this afternoon. Lessons we can learn from geese. First of all, geese practice synergy. You know what synergy is? It's a fact from his article. As each goose flaps its wings, there's a lesson here, it creates an uplift for the birds that fall. By flying in V-shaped 
uniform measure, the whole flock adds 71% greater flying range than if each bird flew alone. I never knew that. Have you ever wondered, you know, in the fall when we start seeing the geese heading south, you know, ah, 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 and they're always in a V-shape. You ever notice that? And if they're not, they're forming it up. But now you know why they fly in that V-shaped formation. So, what lesson can we learn from that? Well, first of all, people who share a common direction and sense of community can get where they're going quicker and easier because they are traveling on the thrust of one another. Dr. Bentley said. Hmm. So, the lesson is people who share a common direction and sense of community can get where they're going quicker and easier because they're traveling on the thrust of one another. And this principle is, is known as synergy. When you take two or more agents working together to produce a result not obtainable by any of the agents independently, like nitrogen. I think, I, I'm not a science teacher, but I think nitrogen is in the air we breathe, right? A little bit. And glycerin, you know, that's a relatively unharmful thing. But what happens when you put them together? Nitroglycerin, very unstable, explosive. So you get the point. So, the lesson is, which explains a, a biblical principle that you may have never thought of. Biblical practice of two by two. Remember when Jesus sent out the 12, Mark 6, 7, and he called the 12 to himself and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. What I want you to see well, I'll make sure you saw it. send them two by two in red. And again, when he sent out the 70, after these things, Luke 10, 1, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them out two by two before his face in every city and place where he himself was. <coughs> So we see that, well also, I thought this was interesting too, Acts 13 too, and they, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas by himself? No. Saul by himself? No. For the work to which I have called him. They were doing exactly what Jesus did, <coughs> sending them out two by two, not alone. Power in numbers, isn't it? So, we see that we can learn from the geese by flocking together, working together as a congregation to bring the lost to Christ, to obedience to the gospel. But not only do Geese practice synergy, they also benefit from mutual edification. There's another two by two, Ecclesiastes 4 and 9. <laughs> two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. And I'm also, I can't remember where it is, I have trouble remembering addresses, but I know a lot of scripture. Iron sharpens iron. You know, there's, a, there's this principle of working together. So we see that the geese indeed do practice what we, we label synergy, and we can learn from that. Our lesson, or, or rather our mission, would be easier to accomplish working together. You know, a lot of times I've heard, well, do you visit? Nope. Do you write cards? Nope. Do you teach? Nope. Are you qualified for it? Nope. Well, what 
what you do there? That's what we pay the prince for. He's supposed to do all of that. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. Wrong. The preacher and Bible teacher's mission is to motivate unity. He's got his hands full of getting all that together, I guarantee you. Of course, you know, he's going to participate if at all possible. But I think you get, get my point. Working together, sharing our gifts, and using. We also see that geese benefit from mutual edification. And here's the fact. Maybe there it is. Where did you go? You notice when a goose falls out of formation. I've watched them. Maybe you have too. I just love it. That's Falls is, is one of my favorite times of year. And when they start heading south, you know, I like, I, quite honestly, I like to hear them, you know. What's that park back in front of us? Coleman Park? You know, there's a pond over there and the geese get there. You can hear rawr, rawr, and taking off and watching them fall them up. But when a goose falls out of formation, it suddenly feels the drag and resistance of flying alone. Begin to see a lesson here. It quickly moves into formation to take advantage of that lifting power of the bird immediately in front of it. So, what's the lesson? If we have as much sense as a goose, I always like to say, you know, God gave us common sense, He gave a gave goose, and He expects us to use it. I think our government can practice that a little bit more. But anyway, if we have as much sense as a goose, we stay in formation with those headed where we want to go. We're willing to accept other people's help and give our help to others. Strong Christians appreciate the value of mutual edification. Mutual edification. Let me say it again. Mutual edification. Not slam ducking or gossiping about somebody. That is not going to edify anybody, especially if you don't want this truth. Our purpose is to strengthen one another and spreading tales and rumors and all this kind of stuff, you know, does not edify, does not build up. And in most cases, it tears down. And especially in strong congregations, we don't need that, do we? Strong Christians appreciate the value of mutual edification. Look what the writer of Hebrews says. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Don't spread rumors. Don't be saying something about somebody slam knocking other brothers or sisters in Christ. But boy, exhort one another daily while it is called to die. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confession steadfast to the end. Yeah, we need to exhort one another. My mother used to say, you know, you <laughs> my mother was a true Christian woman. My daddy was working, if he wasn't being an accountant, he was getting sermons ready, and if he wasn't doing any of that, he was preaching and teaching. So it was pretty much up to my mama, and that's why I use a, a, a lot of things that she said. She said, she told me, she said, if you can't say something nice about somebody, maybe you ought to hurt it. Boy. If you can't say something nice about a brother or a sister, 
Don't say anything, especially if you hadn't verified that is true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we see the geese exhort one another. Look, here's another one. And let us consider one another in order to, what? Stir up love and good works. They spread the rumors and gossip and all that kind of business. Does that stir up love and good works? No. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the matter of some, but exhort. There it is again. Exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. That's what we're supposed to do. Exhort one another. The third lesson we can learn from this is they share the burden. Here's the fact. When the lead goose tires, it rotates back into the formation and another goose flies to the point position. You see what's going on here? Similar to, I think, I, I'm not a bicycle rider, but I think they call that pace lining. And in race cars, if you ever notice how close those guys get to the back of another one, draft, they call it drafting. And if you don't believe it works, you know, getting back of an 18 wheeler, get, get pretty close to them, you're going to find that you're going to have to take your foot off the gas a little bit because you're kind of drafting off of him, making it a lot easier to, to get to where you're going. Well, that's, that's what the, the principle is <coughs> behind these geese. <clears throat> when the lead guy goose gets tired, he moves up to the back and works his way up. <clears throat> so what's the lesson? It pays to take turns doing the hard task and sharing the leadership of the Matash. He said in his article, <clears throat> excuse me, oh my God, he's just giving me a fit. And it's with geese. People are interdependent on each other's skills. You know, we talked about in that in one of our other lessons, you know, about God gave you a gift, he gave me a gift, sometimes more and more. And if he gives you something, he expects you to use it, doesn't he? I wonder if that applies to the gospel. He gave us Jesus. He gave us the gospel. Don't you think we ought to share it? Yeah, yeah. As with geese, people are interdependent on each other's skills. The body principle, remember that lesson? Cap capabilities and unique arrangements of gifts, talents, or resources. We see that. And as members of the body of Christ, we are to do our part. Look at Ephesians 4, 6. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working uh, uh, by which each part does its share. There's a principle we saw in the geese. I almost said gooses, but I didn't geese. <clears throat> Causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Hmm. Fourth principle, geese encourage those who lead. The geese flying in formation honk. That's where I got the title. To encourage those up front to keep up their speed. You see what's going on here? That's why they do honk, honk, honk. You, know, you hear them? I love to hear them doing that. What they're doing is they're encouraging them to lead, lead goose to keep going, keep going. You can do it, you can do it, you can do it. And you can't do it. You can't do that with rumors and gossiping and all kinds of stuff like that. You know? Hurting the feelings of other, other brothers or sisters in Christ. We're to encourage one another. It's unlikely to be complaining that they are going wrong. You think that's what they're honking for? Hey, you're going the wrong way. You're doing, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. That's not right. That's not right. And we need to make sure, you know, that what we believe is the truth. The truth. 
Somebody may not look at a scripture the same way we do. And maybe, maybe they're right. Maybe they're not, maybe they are. But in those kind of cases, we don't slam them upside the head and, <clears throat> you know, get on the head! Because you read out some version of the Bible that it's not any good. You ever heard of that? Yeah, whatever version, I'm not, I'm not going to get off into that. But just because somebody reads another version of the Bible, does that mean they're burning in hell? Oh. But you might think so, so you go up and you slam dunk them like that? Uh-uh. What's that going to do? Is that encouraging? More than likely, you're going to run them off. Not good. Not good at all. And like the good geese, we need to encourage, edify one another rather than be complaining all the time. You ever know somebody like that? It seems like every time they open their mouth, they're complaining about something. How many of you like to be around somebody that's all the time complaining, belly aching about this, belly aching about that? Well, I wish they'd turn the air conditioner up in the church. It's just, I'm just about to burn up. If they don't stop doing it, if they don't turn that air conditioner up, I won't get out. I ain't going to go to that church anymore. You think that's a strong Christian? Is that encouraging? Is that stirring up problem? I don't, of course, I'm just, it's not the case. I was just using that for you, but you get my point. Instead of complaining and belly aching about something, do something about it. Once again, my mama said, Bubba, stop complaining about that. If you see a problem, you fix it. And if you can't fix it, help somebody else fix it. In other words, don't complain about something unless you're willing to do something about it. You know, this, I've seen that in church. You know, people come up and be belly aching to my dad about something. You know, I said, well, he, he told me. He said, well, you know what, 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 what do you think we need to do and how, how would you like to help us? do that. Guess what? They left. And he was being kind. He just went, okay, you got a problem. How do you think we ought to fix it? And are you willing to help us do that? No, no, no. That's not teamwork, is it? And geese don't do that. And like I said, you know, God gave us a good sense and he gave us a goose that expects us to use it. So it's unlikely these geese are complaining that they are going the wrong way. So, we need to make sure honking is encouraging. In groups where there is encouragement, the production is much greater. That's just a fact. That's just good old common East Texas horse sense. So, and power of encouragement to stand by one's heart or core values and encourage the heart and core values of the others is the quality of honking when we sink. We want to encourage one another. Build one another up. And people see that. When people come to visit, they'll see that. If you, I, I, I was telling my wife the other day, I said, you know, I've been, you know, after, I don't know, many years in prison ministry. I pretty much, you put a couple of people side by side, and I'm just going to sit and listen. And I could pretty, make a pretty good judgment of which one's a Christian and which not. Pretty quick. It just seems to, like Peter said, we're a peculiar people. We're not worldly people. And that'll come out pretty quick if you listen to somebody talk long enough and observe their their lifestyle. <clears throat> you can tell pretty quick where they're coming from, which road they're on. The power of encouragement to stand by one's heart or core values, which we all have core values, the book. That's where the heart is. We need to encourage the heart and core values of others to be 
HF is a quality of honking or encouraging that we seek. Paul says in Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. It's corrupt word. What does he mean by that? Well, he tells us, but what is good for ne or, or, or what is good for necessary edification. If it's not necessary for edification, you need to keep our mouth shut. That it may impart grace to hearers. Are you beginning to see what edification and building one another up and honking, if you please, encouraging one another is all about? That it may impart grace to the hearers. Look what he writes in Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. Let your speech always be with grace. Hmm. Boy, if I don't nail it down, I don't know what does. What's grace? Unmerited, undeserved faith. You know, the, the person you, that we were talking to <clears throat> may have done nothing to deserve it. But Lord willing and with the help of the Holy Spirit, we should be able to encourage, build up. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer one another. Hmm. Season with salt. <clears throat> you were the salt of the earth. What's salt do? That's flavor and stuff, doesn't it? You might, you might say salt can, can be a, a spice of life. Our words can be the spice that encourages someone and makes their life better. Also, salt can, you know, can be used for healing, cuts and wounds. I don't like to do it because it hurts, it burns, but it kills germs too. Mm -hmm. I wish it kill, kill the germs of false teaching, the germs of a lost soul, that you may know how you ought to answer one another. Uh -oh. Geese care for one another. Bet you didn't know that. Here's a, here's a fact. When a goose gets sick, and I've never seen this, gets sick, wounded, or shot down, two geese drop out of formation and follow it down to help and protect it. Now, like I said, I've never seen that. I, I am not a hunter. I am not, but I went with my grandfather when I was a kid. He liked to hunt duck. He'd, he'd shoot and then one of them would fall. I never saw one do that, but I don't doubt what this guy says. You know, like I said, ge geese have common sense, and if they see something that's about shooting at them, they may not want to go down and help. But anyway, you get the point. When you get sick, wounded, or shot down, two geese drop out of formation and follow it down to help it and protect it. They stay with it until it dies. Or is unable to fly again. And that may be why <laughs> I've never seen the because when my grandfather shot them down, they were dead. They weren't alive and that might be. Well, no need going down. These are gone there and just kept on going. I don't know. But normally that's what they do. Geese care for one another. After they do that, they launch out with another formation or catch up with the flock. We have as much sense as a goose. We will stand by each other in difficult times as well as when we are strong. If we're edifying one another, and as a congregation, even a smaller congregation, we, you know, they, you've been around long enough. There's going to come times it's, it's very difficult. Things that trials that we go through that we don't really like. 
the death of a loved one. You know, kill folks die. Uh, stricken with some kind of disease that we don't care for. Uh, wayward children. There's all kinds of difficulties in this life that we live. And that's why it's important to be a member of a God-fearing body of Christ, the Church of Christ. Hopefully we're the kind that build up one another. What does the world do? If they feel you got problems? Not, not everyone, but generally speaking, you know, I don't want to be around somebody like that. You know, you know they got this problem. They got that problem. That, you know, instead of encouraging them, trying to help them out, the world says, I don't want to be around. I don't want to be around people that's happy, joyful all the time. Of course, I do too, but that don't mean we ignore our brothers and sisters who's going through some kind of difficulty. If, if we have that gift, be able to encourage and help them by cracking. We need to use it and do that. Another benefit in working together is the duty of spiritual brethren. Look at Ecclesiastes 4.10. For if they fall, <clears throat> one will lift up his companion. You see what, what it's saying? This kind of falls in line with not being a working alone. But if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls. For he has no one to help him up. <clears throat> now surely if a goose has got enough sense to go down and help another goose, we got as much sense, don't we? Notice the word help, not condemn. Help somebody get up <clears throat> when they're falling down. Paul writes to the church in the Galatia province. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you go to him and tell him he's going to burn in hell. So see, we can do something from geese camp. And I tried to bring out those, those facts. I don't think there's anyone here this afternoon that hadn't obeyed the gospel. Maybe you have been using the common sense God dad yet learn lessons from geese. Maybe you need to repent. I don't know. But I think we ought to practice what we preach. We're here to help you. To restore you. <coughs> not condemn you. So you can work with us here and be an active member of the church here. Whatever you need. If you need to be baptized, we're here to do it. Whatever. You know, now's the time. To either repent or obey the gospel.
gospel and be in Christ. Because if you're not in Jesus' army, you're automatically in Satan's. Come join us, won't you? While we stand in Satan. Have I enough?